You're watching North Alabama's News Leader. WHNT News 19 this morning starts now. Now at 6, Hurricane Sally has already brought 20 inches of rain or more in several parts of Baldwin County and Escambia County, Florida. That rain coming down in sheets. Uh, this look from Gulf Shores, where Sally made landfall just before uh, 5 a.m., about 4.45 this morning. In fact, according to poweroutage.us this morning, more than 118,000 customers in Baldwin County alone are without power. In Mobile County, nearly 90,000. No idea where that boat came from. Well, breaking right now, this video just into our newsroom. Volunteers with the United Cajun Navy captured this video of some damage in Orange Beach. The damage happened as the eye wall of Sally passed through the area. Debris, as you can see, across roads while other parts of the city are still underwater. Orange Beach is closed until at least noon today. And Hurricane Sally is where we begin this morning, along with our weather authority, meteorologist Ben Smith. Yeah, Ben, this is, am I right? This is the first storm to make landfall, first hurricane to make landfall on Alabama soil in, what, 16 years? Yeah, it's, it's been a little while. You have to go back to, you know, Ivan in 2004, and that was a big season, especially for folks in Florida. And you can see how the system is now on shore here over Baldwin County. Winds at 105 miles per hour. We'll zoom on in and show you where the Iowa is now crossing past Gulf Shores, getting closer to Foley, and all those bands you see there that are wrapping around the center of circulation have wind gusts over hurricane force. We've had that all morning. The latest uh, wind gust at Pensacola we had last hour was at 86, and now they're at 81 mile per hour wind gust there. Also 67 miles per hour in Mobile. They had a wind gust of 74 last hour, and even as far east as Panama City, that's a significant wind gust way out ahead of the center center circulation and here are some of the rainfall totals you see some of the white some of that gray area upwards of two feet of rain has fallen over most of Baldwin County already and we are still not done yet there's a look at the track taking it up to the north and east thankfully we are not in the cone still close enough to have some breezy conditions maybe a few bands of rainfall but nothing significant for us in the Tennessee Valley look at the winds out of the east at 11 miles per hour from Montesano at 65 degrees it will be a breezy afternoon today Temperatures will warm from the upper 60s to upper 70s later on. 71, breezy out at the bus stop. The high today is 79. We'll take a close look at Sally, and I think you're going to like our weekend forecast. That's just in a few minutes. All right, now some help from North Alabama is on the Gulf Coast. Members of Alabama's Task Force 3 mobilized. They deployed to South Alabama to assist with any water rescues that may be needed. The team was notified through the Alabama Mutual Aid System Monday, and they left Tuesday. Lieutenant Blake Farmer of the Boaz Fire Department emphasized the team effort needed during an emergency like this. All of us bring a piece to the table, whether it's communication equipment or if it's the boats or, you know, we all got a piece of equipment that we bring together whenever that they call for us. So this is how we designed it in our division up here. Uh, so everybody's got a piece of the, the puzzle. The Swift Water Response Team is made up of 21 members from fire and rescue departments with special training out of Fort Payne, Decatur, Gunnersville, and Madison, as well as the Boaz Fire Department. Alabama Attorney General Steve Marshall announced the state's price gouging law took effect when Governor Ivey declared a state of emergency on Monday. He also warns of home repair fraud as Hurricane Sally uh, will make its way across the state. Under the law, it prohibits the, quote, unconscionable pricing of items for sale or rent, detailing specifically a price that is 25 percent or more above the average price charged in the same area in the last 30 days, unless it can be attributed or can't be attributed to reasonable cost as uh, a case of unconscionable pricing. Well, new this morning, Amazon making an impact in North Alabama, helping to grow computer science in the classroom. And News 19's Ashton Hyren is in the newsroom to tell us about the company's future engineer program. 
Good morning, Melissa and Steve. Well, the Future Engineer program is Amazon's way of bringing technology and computer science classes to schools across the country that may not have access to it. And three elementary schools in Decatur are now part of that program. According to Decatur City Schools, Amazon is funding computer science education and teacher professional development for three elementary schools in the school district. Now, that's about 1,500 students who will now have the opportunity to learn and prosper in the technology field. Woodmead Elementary, West Decatur Elementary and Eastwood Elementary are the three schools that will launch the project. They are some of 5,000 schools that this project applies to. Now through this program, usually teachers and students receive professional development and coding lessons in person. They're now shifted online, but leaders say it's still an effective way to increase access to computer science and to STEM education. In the newsroom, Ashton Hiring, News 19. Huntsville City Council members had their first chance to ask some questions about the mayor's proposed $236 million budget last night. They met for a special session. Uh, the $236 million spending plan represents an $8.1 million increase over last year's fiscal plan. And America calls it a cautious and conservative approach to next year's spending. Highlights in the proposal include a 1% pay increase for employees, a new $4 million fire station in West Huntsville, and $36 million for street resurfacing and construction. More than $46 million has also been set aside for municipal facilities, which include a new city hall. Mayor Battle says Huntsville desperately needs one. You know, New City Hall, we have put it off as long as we can. Uh, but uh, but this building was built in 1961, uh, and it has come to the end of its useful life. But being able to bring everybody in the city uh, together, to be able to work together and, and work in one single place, it brings for a little bit more harmony of, of, of the mission that we have here. But it also is a little bit more efficient. Uh, several council members did question whether some money could be cut from the City Hall project. A final vote on the budget is set for September 24th. Okay, let's take another look at the roads. Melissa, we've been doing well. Is that continuing? Yeah, I, I don't want to jinx this, but uh, so far, really, all this week, the roads have been looking good for your early morning drives. And uh, now, at just a little bit after 6 o'clock, that is still the case. In fact, the only thing we want to point out to you, and just because of where this is, is a car that stopped there on South Parkway. This is going to be just south of Airport Road. So if you're headed uh, into Huntsville on the Parkway this morning, and maybe slow down through that area to watch out and see if anyone may be uh, working on a car there alongside the road. A nonprofit is on a mission to bring a zoo to North Alabama. Yeah, but they need your help to do that. Jordan Daptis is live with this morning with uh, more on this entire really cool idea. Yeah, Melissa and Steve, the North Alabama Zoological Society wants to bring a full-size modern aquarium modern accredited zoo and aquarium to the Huntsville area and they're starting a campaign not only to raise money for this project but also to bring awareness to their efforts to make this zoo happen. They're running a six week fundraising campaign with the goal of raising six million dollars over the next 12 months. They say this initial round of funding will be used to look for the zoo's location, facility design and planning to recruit zoo talent to the team and launch a research campus. Executive Director Ethan and Woodruff says they estimate it will cost a total of $30 million to make phase one of the zoo a reality. The plan for the completed zoo and aquarium is between 250 and 300 acres. Exhibit areas would cover 150 acres. A veterinarian hospital, wildlife rehab center, off-viewing barns and paddocks, greenhouses for sustainable food, grow and support buildings would cover the rest of the space. The campaign's main goal is to receive a land donation or long-term lease for the acreage. The nonprofit says they have been shown some potential locations with good public access that could be purchased as a secondary option. The cost of these current purchase options is around three and a half million dollars. Now, North Alabama Zoological Society is going to be hosting a Q&A tomorrow night. You can watch that on their Facebook page. We have all of their information on our website. That's WHNT.com. We also have more details about their efforts. Live this morning, Jordan Depp, NAFTAS News 19. Of course, Sally's been on shore about an hour and 20 minutes now. Category 2 hurricane, where the system is headed. 
What about the impacts around here? And I think you're going to like our weekend forecast. A new video into our newsroom this morning. This coming from Pensacola Beach, Florida, flooding overnight from Hurricane Sally. The National Hurricane Center says the storm could drop up to two and a half feet of rain in some places, and storm surge could reach as high as seven feet. We are still just seeing the impact now, and as the light comes up, we'll see oh, more yeah. of it. Uh, Sally made landfall near Gulf Shores about an hour and a half ago uh, through the night. Crews out working to help restore power to what a couple of hundred thousand people are now uh, said to be without power in that area. Yeah, we've seen the transformers blowing left and right. When Dolphin Island protects Protective sand dunes sadly washed away. The National Weather Service in Mobile calling the storm historic. It's already brought in around 20 inches of rain in parts of Baldwin and Escambia counties. One of the greatest threats the NWS is warning about is life-threatening flood waters. While well, Governor Kay Ivey and emergency management officials expressed uh, the wish that everyone take cover, some folks are waiting to en actually enjoy the weekend that's coming. After the storm, I'm just looking through and, and, and looking at the weekend. It's going to be sunny at 75, nice beach down here in Mobile, Alabama. Well, in Orange Beach, strong winds and high waters broke a private pier in Bayou St. Louis. Uh, waves are expected to break between 10 and 15 feet high in the surf zone. According to Enki Research, a company that tracks storm damage, the financial toll from Hurricane Sally could be up to uh, 2 or $3 billion. That's billion with the B. All right, meteorologist Ben Smith, uh, what is the NWS National Weather Service sharing about Sally right now? Well, uh, we're just waiting, Steve, because the system is not over with yet. Obviously, you can see Baldwin County is there. The eye is on shore. There's a look at Pensacola. We just talked about that a little while ago. Last hour, a wind gust to 81 miles per hour in the water vapor loop showing all that moisture, the green just moving inland, taking over. Looks like the eye was about to cross I-10 right now. And any of those bands you see that are rotating around that center of circulation are producing uh, tornadoes as well. We always get that with a landfalling uh, tropical system. You can see 81 mile per hour wind gust at Pensacola, still a 63 mile per hour wind gust in Mobile. It's been like that for the last several hours. And again, those rainfall totals you were just talking about, there's a look it. Gulf Shores, Foley, back toward Dolphin Island. You can see those rainfall totals over 20 inches over the last 24 hours. Significant flooding going on. There's the official track moving across southeast Alabama through tomorrow as a tropical storm, then a tropical depression crossing the Savannah River and then heading into the Carolinas. Thankfully, we are not in the cone, but still close enough to bring us a little bit of wind, a little bit of rainfall, and this would be generous to get two to three inches down to the south and east, we're probably going to get more like upwards of a half of an inch or so, even if we get that. Everything is trending to the south and east. Either way, it's not going to be a big factor for us. Maybe some wind gusts upwards of 30 miles per hour, a few rain bands, but all of the action is south and east of us with Sally. Right now, temperatures are in the 60s to near 70. We'll watch some of those gusty winds as well. We've already had some wind gusts over 20 miles per hour up on Sand Mountain, and especially up on Lookout Mountain, get a little bit windy later on today. Let's go ahead and check out our future cast. Once again, a few isolated showers here and there heading into your Wednesday. And I think we'll have a similar forecast Thursday. Then after that, it dries out in a hurry. This is probably going to be the best weekend we have had in several months with highs in the upper 70s, low humidity, very pleasant mornings, mid to upper 50s. I think I can safely say we may not see 90 degrees again until next spring. For this week's tools for teachers, we are headed to Lauderdale County. And Ben Smith introduces us to a teacher who calls Brooks Elementary home. We had heard good things, but we had not seen them. And when we did see them, we just could not believe, you know, the gem that we had picked up in Ms. Bowen. She is an astonishing teacher and really not only goes above and beyond, but she steps out of the box, out of the classroom, and really just does. Uh, just goes the extra mile for her students every day. That's Principal Adam Moody. And those compliments belong to Heather Bowen. She teaches third grade at Brooks Elementary in Lauderdale County. Time to give her a call. Let's uh, see if we can get her on. Um, she has no idea, so it's going to be... <laughs> She's going to be so, so excited. 
All right, folks, we're calling Miss Bowen out to surprise her with three hundred and nineteen dollars. Hey, Miss Bowen, how are you today? Hello, Mr. Ben, how are you? Hey, I am absolutely fantastic. It's a, it's a great day. Uh, I have some wonderful news for you. Have any idea why we're calling? Um, I'm going to say no, so you can enlighten me. <laughs> okay, well, you won our Tools for Teachers Award on News 19. No way. <laughs> yes way. That is awesome. I'm so excited. <laughs> Thank you. Well, how would you like a $319 gift card? I would love a three hundred and nineteen dollar gift card. That would be fantastic. Every day is actually fun fun days to come to work. Her kids keep her going. I have awesome students every year and they make every day enjoyable and awesome. So by far they're the biggest reason I enjoy my job. Despite the challenges of COVID nineteen, Brooks Elementary uses the virus as a learning opportunity. And we're actually getting a lot more done with that small class size. So it's been really a great experience so far. And Mr. Moody couldn't be more excited. It's like a, it's a teacher's dream, Mr. <laughs> ben. I mean, it is, uh, it's everything we've, we've dreamed about as teachers. Just uh, you can move and do so much. And it's really a one-on-one -on -one experience almost every day. And some advice for fellow teachers during this challenging time. You can be safe and teach and have fun at the same time. And I think there's just a balance that we all have to find and do what's comfortable for each one of us. Thank you to Ms. Bowen and all the other teachers working uh, to help our kids during these times. And you can nominate a deserving teacher at WHNT.com. Click on the Tools for Teachers section on this story. Nominees can teach in public or private schools, preschool through 12th grade, anywhere in the News 19 viewing area. Honorees will get that $319 for their classrooms. It's surprising when Fife doesn't win a state title. That's how often it has happened in recent years. Paul Benefield and the Red Devils going for their 34th straight win on Friday night. We'll preview that matchup coming up next. Here's a live shot of the cloudy Albertville. It's 66 degrees, but again, the winds are out of the east at 7. We had a wind gust over 20 miles per hour last hour. So again, get ready for breezy conditions today. 68 degrees in Decatur, 70 in the Shoals. There will be a few widely scattered showers out there. We're already seeing a few of those trying to sneak into Blunt County, also Etowah County down to the south. Once again, there will be some showers around. Best chance of that will be to the east and to the south. How about 71 degrees? A little breezy as we head to work today, but overall our rain chances aren't very high. High temperatures today, it'll be cooler down to the south because of the cloud cover and rainfall closer to the center of circulation where Sally is. Not as much cloud cover up to the north and west. I think that's why we'll be in the upper 70s to near 80 degrees up around southern middle Tennessee. Of course, a beach forecast today, obviously a no-go. But as we head into tomorrow, and especially on Friday, as Sally finally pulls away, rain chances down, temperatures recover some. It's still the rip current threat will be high out there, but at least the heavy rainfall and the strong gusty winds will be gone. You know your team is unbelievable when it's basically expected to win a title every year. Since 2014, Fife Football has put together an 88-3 record with four state championships. Simply incredible stuff. 2020, no different for the Red Devils as they are off to a 3-0 start. Friday night, head coach Paul Benefield and the Red Devils will hit the road to face Brindley Mountain. While the Lions haven't won a football game since 2017, Benefield says that his team has to focus on themselves and not worry about their opponent. It doesn't matter who that might be or when and where they play them. They're a young team, uh, not had a program very long, but we're five and everybody, we have a target on our back, so we know we're going to get their best, so we know we have to be prepared regardless. Well, they're young, you know, they're a young program, basically. Football is a sport hard to hard to, to build up and get competitive, and, you know, they're they're trying, Coach Garner trying to get, get more kids out, and they've had some COVID, you know, all this stuff going on. So, you know, we just got to go and do what we do and try to worry about five getting better. Former Auburn center and football analyst Cole Kubelik was in the 256 visiting the Huntsville quarterback club. Kubelik is one of the few who's actually been inside a college football game this season. And even though it's a different atmosphere, he says he can't complain about having football back again. As far as SEC play goes, he thinks this conference-only season will be one of the most intense yet. I think those games are actually going to be bigger because things are going to be compressed. And 
you're only having conference games. A loss in this season is going to be much more impactful than other seasons, mainly because you don't have the room to make up the ground. You drop one or two early and the other teams in your division win two or three games, now you're in trouble. Jalen Waddell is widely considered as one of the best return specialists in the country. The Alabama junior wideout averaged 35 yards per punt return and just under 25 yards per kickoff. But that didn't stop the opposition from kicking his way. Waddell asked if he feels like that will change in 2020. Oh uh, well, you got to expect alternative kicks and a lot of uh, different type of kicks. But I do expect uh, teams to kick it to me just based on like field position and not trying to give up too much of uh, field position. So you have to uh, kind of kick it. For more, you can check out whnt.com. That's it for sports. Having once lived in Mobile, I'm well aware that those who live on the Gulf Coast are all too familiar with Mother Nature's wrath. We still hope and pray that Sally will not bring that type of pain and heartache. But my fellow Alabamians, Hurricane Sally is not to be taken for granted. Well, Governor Ivey speaking at a press conference ahead of Hurricane Sally on Tuesday. Now that the storm has made landfall, resources are mobilized and ready to respond. Well, according to poweroutage.us, in Baldwin County, more than 124,000 people and their homes and their businesses are without power right now. In Mobile County, more than 130,000 as of this moment. A Sally made landfall near Gulf Shores about 4.45 this morning. A view from the Alabama Department of Transportation cameras from Mobile, Orange Beast, and Gulf Shores. Now, as around 24 inches of rain have fallen just so far, more still falling as we speak. And in Orange Beach, overturned boats and debris lining the roads. This video from the Cajun Navy. The damage happened as the eye wall of Sally passed through the area. You can see here people inside a parking deck struggling to walk against the wind, showing just how strong winds were in that area and may still be. National Weather Service in Mobile calling Hurricane Sally historic as it makes landfall on Alabama soil for the first time, a hurricane in 16 years to the day Hurricane Ivan hit back in 2004. And meteorologist Ben Smith joins us now. And uh, Ben, I guess we should ask, what is Sally doing right now? Yeah, the wind gusts in Pensacola are over 90 miles per hour right now. They're on that right side, which is always the most dangerous side of these hurricanes. You can see the wall or the eye now on shore in Baldwin County. Winds at 105 Category 2. We can zoom on in. There's a look at Foley and Somerdale. And again, these bands you see there that are coming around the outer edges, those are the ones that have the hurricane force gusts with them, uh, the potential for tornadoes as well. We've had multiple tornado warnings. There's that 92 mile per hour gust in Pensacola the last hour, 71 mile per hour gust in Mobile. You've also had wind gusts over hurricane force early this morning. Now, the uh, rainfall totals, they continue to uh, increase here where you see the white color there. Over 20 inches of rainfall around Foley, Orange Beach, Gulf Shores, back toward Dolphin Island. So again, significant flooding, storm surge as well with Sally as the system moves inland. We'll be weakening to a tropical storm, to a depression, and thankfully far enough south where there's not going to be a significant impact around here. Breezy conditions, though, you can see from Montesano, east-southeast winds at 13 miles per hour. We've already had gusts over 20 miles per hour for this morning. So expect a breezy afternoon noon today with a few isolated showers here and there. No big problem at the bus stop at 71 degrees. We'll be at 79 degrees today. Of course, a closer look at Sally and a much improved forecast for us down the road coming up in just a moment. Now for your News 19 eye opener on Wednesday, September 16th. The average FBS football player spends 44 hours per week in their sport alone. Democrats on the committee say college athletes struggle with food and economic insecurity, even though universities and coaches make millions. But Republicans on the committee say student athletes are already compensated through their education. They're not staged or to trick anybody, it's to see how fast you react. By showing how officers train, it sheds light on the rules they follow, the reactions they learn, and how dangerous their jobs can be. Restaurants and bars are now allowed 50% capacity, so the ABC board says the need to provide emergency curbside service is no longer necessary. I understand the point of cutting it off, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's just additional revenue for them, and also it gets people happier who do want that option. Well, 
as more students in North Alabama school districts head back to in-person learning, others have closed their doors temporarily as more students test positive for COVID-19. The Alabama Department of Public Health says it does have a case monitoring system, which applies to all schools. Yeah, and case monitors that ADPH says have experience in case investigation and contact tracing prior to the pandemic will be watching school systems across Alabama. However, the department does say that school reports are key to helping investigators trace, but as only two case investigators are working in North Alabama counties, it's still tough to do. And health officials say that returning to a pre-pandemic form of life is going to require a vaccine. Yeah, and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention did say a few weeks ago that the states need to get ready to distribute a vaccine. News 19's Ashton Hiron is live in the newsroom. And Ashton, what did the Alabama Department of Public Health say about all this? Listen, Steve, when we asked them, they said that they started having discussions about it, but the details are still fluid. President Donald Trump said Tuesday that we could have a vaccine in a matter of weeks, maybe four to eight weeks. The president stressed that he sped up the approval process amid the pandemic. CDC documents urge states to prepare for a vaccine that is administered twice, 21 or 28 days apart. CDC also advises that states prioritize health workers and people working and living in nursing homes. And then government advisors will prioritize who's next. That's likely physically vulnerable populations. Vaccine trials normally take years. Dr. Richard Spera, an infectious disease specialist and chief medical officer for Allometrics, says vaccine testing has to show a statistically significant benefit to the patient or harm to the patient. And to be approved for use in the in our country by the FDA, it has to be shown that it is effective. Um, in other words, does it work? And secondly, does it hurt anything? Now, we took to Facebook to ask some of you if you would get a COVID-19 vaccine if it was made available by November 1st of this year. Here are a couple of the responses. Melissa Ann Holt says, no, I would wait a year or two to see what the long-term side effects are. I really don't trust something coming out of, that is rushed. And Holly Hall also chimed in, commenting, how do you take a vaccine that was basically created overnight when it took years to create other vaccines? We also asked Governor Ivey's office about vaccine preparations. A spokesperson for her office told us that conversations have started on their end. The CDC says the FDA will either license the vaccine or give it an emergency use authorization. In the newsroom, Ashton Hiring, News 19. All right, Ashton, thank you. Well, COVID-19 cocktail kits with bottles of liquor from your favorite bar or restaurant are coming to an end. Alabama Alcohol and Beverage Control Board will not extend the emergency order allowing curbside and to-go sales of alcoholic beverages. Restaurants and bars are now allowed 50% capacity, so the ABC board says the need to provide emergency curbside service is no longer necessary. Fat Sammy's bar director, Jeremy Conception, says the to-go cocktail kits help them stay afloat after getting Getting shut down just two days following the grand opening. When the shutdown first happened, we did these these to-go cocktail kits called Cuddy Bangs. In the beginning, for the first three months, it was key. And if we didn't have that, we would have been in bad shape. Now, despite all that, COVID-19 has put the food and entertainment industry through a Fat Sammy, uh, Fat Sammy crediting their success in staying afloat during the pandemic to the staff that they've hired and having two partners who actually had experience in the industry. All right, another look at our roads. We've been doing well this morning. I have my fingers crossed, Melissa. Yeah, still no major problems out there, but we are starting to see some backups, particularly in the Decatur area. Uh, starting with this one, a Waze user showing some very slow going on uh, 20. This is as you're coming in to Decatur, approaching Woodall Road, only moving about four miles an hour there. And that's been a consistent issue over the last 20 minutes or so. Once you get uh, more into Decatur as you're approaching the bridge, Wilson Street also very slow going. Traffic down to about nine miles an hour there. And on the other side of the river, Old Highway 20 seeing some moderate traffic, only moving about 16 miles an hour as folks try to make it out to County Line Road. But again, no major problems. If that changes, we will certainly let you know. Well, an Atlanta-based development group is planning to spend millions of dollars in North Alabama. Uh, the project will also bring in hundreds of jobs. And News 19's Jordan Daphnis is live to tell us more about it. 
Yeah, Melissa and Steve, this group is called Intersect, and according to our news partners at AL.com, they plan to break ground this fall on a project called Huntsville 565 Logistics Park. Now, this is going to be a $35 million investment, and it's planned to be home to more than 300 workers in e-commerce or local logistics and services. They plan to have construction completed by 2021. The project in its entirety will be more than 144,000 square feet. They say it will be built on 47 acres of land, and it will be adjacent to GE Aviation, the Target Distribution Center, Polaris Manufacturing, and the new Mazda Toyota factory that's still under construction. Scott Brown, a founding partner with Intersect, says this is an exciting time for the Huntsville business community and its workers who will benefit from this new investment. He also says they plan to get started on this project very quickly and get those jobs going for people here in the Huntsville community. Live this morning, Jordan Daphnis, News 19. Sally's been on shore almost two hours now over South Alabama, still bringing hurricane force winds, heavy rainfall, where the system is going and what it could mean for us in North Alabama coming up. Well, right this moment, Hurricane Sally is hitting the coast of uh, Florida and Alabama, Alabama more than uh, Florida. It uh, came ashore at 445 at Gulf Shores. Elizabeth Lane is in Mobile this morning with an update on conditions there. I want to show you the conditions here that we're seeing. This is downtown Mobile, just off of the Mobile Bay. The winds associated with this storm are extremely strong, as Sally did make landfall as a Category 2 and is expected to weaken. But here's the catch. Sally is moving extremely slowly at a very slow 3 miles per hour, dumping lots of prolonged rain. That is going to be a big difference maker in terms of the amount of possible historic flash flooding and the potential for life-threatening storm surge. This is definitely something that people in this area should be taking seriously. And we know that at this hour, about 260,000 people are without power. You can see that light pole in front of you is just shaking like a leaf on a tree. And a few minutes ago, we saw parts of a parking structure that cement that had been picked up and tossed around by these winds here downtown. We also know that Governor Kay Ivey has authorized the Alabama National Guard to be standing by up and down the coast, ready to perform search and rescue operations at a moment's notice. They are working alongside FEMA teams from neighboring states as Hurricane Sally moves through and makes its mark here on South Alabama, as well as parts of the Florida Panhandle. All right, we're joined now by meteorologist Ben Smith, who's uh, keeping a very close eye on Hurricane Sally, which Ben is just hanging out on the coast. Yeah, Gulf Shores, as, as she said a little while ago, came on shore about two hours ago. Look how far the water is coming inland here. The sea out there real angry as Sally moves inland. Wind still at 105 miles per hour. Waiting for the 7 o'clock update. You can see the uh, center of circulation is on shore over Baldwin County now, and these bands of rain and wind just continue to wrap around the center of circulation. There's a water vapor loop showing all that moisture you see in green crossing I-10 now. And anywhere you see those bands that are moving around the center of circulation like that, that's where we have those hurricane force gusts. That's where we have the potential for tornadoes as well. But check out that wind gust at Pensacola at 92 miles per hour. Just right now, 71 mile per hour gust in Mobile. So again, wind gusts over hurricane force, and there are some of the rainfall tolls, that white color, that gray color, over 20 inches of rainfall, places like Foley back toward Fairhope, Gulf Shores, Dolphin Island, right along the uh, Baldwin County coast, you're seeing some significant rainfall. The track takes the system up to the north and east, well south of the Tennessee Valley, weakening it to a tropical depression and eventually just an area of low pressure. Close enough to bring us some rainfall here, but nothing too significant. Each model run we look at continues to push the heavier rainfall to our south and east. So we'll see how much we get. Uh, right now, we're not expecting a big time event at all, just a few rain bands here and there. But the strongest wind 
heaviest rainfall to our south. Starting in the 60s to near 70, already some wind gusts over 20 miles per hour in Albertville and Fort Payne. We'll watch some of those showers moving up to the north today. And again, scattered showers are possible through this afternoon, also tomorrow, and then it dries out nicely. I think this weekend is going to be one of the best weekends we've had this year by far as far as the summer uh, heading into the early fall temperatures in the upper 70s overnight lows in the mid to upper 50s uh, no rainfall looks really good heading into next week well as our teachers know classroom learning a challenge especially right now keeping those kids six feet apart while still trying to fit some desks in the classroom. So a teacher in Northfield, Minnesota, and a parent collaborated to create a new kind of learning environment, portable desks that can be used outside. Michelle Martin reached out to one of her students' parents who owns a custom furniture company. She asked for a small portable desk and stool for outdoor learning. Now, more than 180 have been made for students who will do class outside through the month of October, weather permitting, and then they will move the portable desks inside through the winter. Coming up, slow-moving Hurricane Sally threatens millions as it hammers the Gulf Coast. Plus, after a civil settlement for her daughter's wrongful death at the hands of police, Breonna Taylor's mother tells us about the continuing fight for justice. Coming up on CBS This Morning. Cloudy sky from McFarland Park this morning at 70. Look at the winds out of the east at 10 miles per hour. It's going to be a breezy afternoon around here with showers at times. 69 degrees in Huntsville, Decatur at 68 and 66 degrees with some breezy conditions over in Fort Payne as well. You can already see some of those showers trying to drift up to the north here about the cross US 278. So again, there will be some showers around today. Uh, just a few isolated showers for the morning commute, mainly down to the south and east at about 71 degrees. Today's highs uh, mid to upper 70s, a few low 80s up to the north and west, not as warm down to the south. And again, we're expecting Sally to stay to our south, just breezy conditions with a few showers at times. Well, CBS This Morning is next, but first here's our top three things for your Wednesday morning. About 4.45 this morning, Hurricane Sally made landfall near Gulf Shores. The National Weather Service in Mobile calling the storm historic for potentially deadly flooding. Members of Alabama Task Force 3 mobilized and are in South Alabama assisting in any needed water rescues. The Swift Water Response Team is made up of 21 members from fire and rescue departments out of Fort Payne, Decatur, Gunnersville, and Madison, as well as the Boaz Fire Department. And former Alabama State Senator David Burkett will plead guilty to a misdemeanor campaign finance charge. An agreement would require him to pay a $2,000 fine and waive his right to appeal. Prosecutors would also not seek restitution or demand a particular sentence. Burkett was accused of depositing more than $3,600 in campaign contribution checks into his personal bank account or cash them. Heartbreaking drone footage in Oregon shows street after street after street of homes in the city of Talent burned, most of them to the very ground. In many cases, all that remains is just the outline of the home's foundation. Oregon Emergency Management says over 1,000 homes have been destroyed in the fires in California. More than 16,600 firefighters are battling more than two dozen wildfires. Officials confirm at least 25 people have died in California from the wildfires, eight in Oregon. Officials say returning to a normal way of life will require a vaccine. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention recently notified states to start initial planning for a vaccine. Health officials here in Alabama say they've had discussions about this. President Donald Trump said Tuesday that we could have a vaccine in a matter of weeks, maybe four to eight weeks. The president stressed that he's sped up the approval process amid the pandemic. CDC documents urge states to prepare for a vaccine that is administered twice, 21 or 28 days apart. The CDC also advises that that states prioritize health workers and people working and living in nursing homes. And then government advisors will prioritize who's next. That's likely physically vulnerable populations. Vaccine trials normally take years. Now, we asked Governor Kay Ivey's office about vaccine preparations. A spokesperson for her office told us that conversations have started on their end. The CDC says the FDA will either license the vaccine or give it an emergency use authorization. In the newsroom, Ashton Hiring, News 19. All right, Ashton, thank you. Let's get one last look at traffic. And we have picked up our first wreck of the morning. This one is going to be in the Athens area. This is going to be on uh, 31 
And so it's, Cross Street is East Sandiford Road. If you can avoid that area, you're going to want to do so. Other than that, just a few slow moving spots, including uh, kind of the travel part of the morning. This is a 20 heading into Decatur, very slow going there, still only moving about nine miles an hour. Todd's right, going to find a look at weather. All right, cloudy sky. We have some light rainfall over south and eastern sections this morning. It is breezy outside as well. Already wind gusts over 20 miles per hour. Similar scenario for tomorrow, and then we are looking good this weekend. Mid to upper 70s, low humidity, sunny skies. Of course, Sally making landfall at 4:45 this morning over Gulf Shores. Of course, the brunt of that system heading to our south and east, and not a big impact around here. All right, thanks for watching News 19 CBS this morning. Right after the break.